In my last film, I addressed the vast range of symptoms possible upon a COVID-19 infection. But why are people responding so differently? Why do some people get no symptoms at all, whilst others have almost every organ seemingly ravaged? When you've got a virus that mutates every two weeks, could it be possible that not everyone is being infected with the same bug? Let's investigate. All viruses mutate. It's part of their natural life cycle. SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, a collection of genetic material packed inside a protein shell. What does that mean? Well, that it's more likely to mutate than a DNA virus. This is because RNA is a less stable molecule than DNA, and RNA viruses don't have a built-in proofreading step into their replication. So mistakes can happen frequently, and the host cell does not correct them. In the world of RNA viruses, change is the norm. We expect RNA viruses to change frequently. That's just their nature, says Dr. Mark Schleiss. In my last film, I showed how long haulers were reporting different versions of the virus according to the symptoms presented. Some had the classic cough and fever, whilst others had a version that presented nausea, GI issues and chills. And this second version has been picked up in studies. This one in the BMJ Gut Journal and reported in the press too. Here's the eye. Researchers also believe that those who have gastrointestinal symptoms could have a more severe form of the disease, with higher fevers, a greater risk of liver injury, and longer overall recovery times. So what is this different form of the disease? Is the press onto something? USA Today, eight strains of the coronavirus are circling the globe, and the UK tabloid press, not to be outdone, a new report released today claims there are at least 12 different strains of coronavirus spreading through the UK in March. Sounds bad, doesn't it? This virus is confusing enough without it perpetually mutating into new and potentially even scarier forms. Credit to the Mail Online for once, for tempering the tabloid sensationalism and actually noting that none of these strains were actually any more dangerous than the other. Dip into the research itself and you'll find that, amongst others, we've seen S and L lineages along with A, B and C variations. But whilst these strains may have genetic differences, these differences haven't led to any kind of observed behavioural divergence. Perhaps a terrible metaphor, but imagine that the S, L, A, B and C strains are trim levels of vehicle. So you've got your Ford Focus uh, L, GL, GLX and maybe gear, but none of them will get you to the shops any quicker or carry any more stuff. What we're on the lookout for here is a pickup truck or a sports car, depending on how you want to twist the metaphor. Back in April, the Los Alamos National Laboratory thought they'd found one. Say hello to the Italian strain. For a little while, there was some doubt as to whether the Italian strain was any more important than any of the others. As usual, Ed Yong wrote a fantastic article about it for The Atlantic in May. He quotes Lisa Grilinski of the University of North Carolina, who is one of the few scientists in the world who specializes in coronaviruses. To say that you've revealed the emergence of a more transmissible form of SARS-CoV-2 without ever actually testing it isn't the type of thing that makes me feel comfortable as a scientist. And she wasn't alone. Brian Wasik, Nathan Grubau and Charlotte Holdcroft all agreeing. Not every mutation creates a different strain, says Grubau. The discussion here involves the difference between the D and the G forms of the virus. The D lineage, uh, including the one that first emerged in Wuhan in December, whilst the G lineage first seen in Europe in February and has become known as the Italian strain. Worldwide, the Gs were relatively uncommon in early March, but by April they had become dominant in much of Europe, North America and Australia. But this pattern is hard to interpret. The D614G mutation, the Italian strain, might make the coronavirus more transmissible, and G viruses might have become more common because they outcompeted the D viruses. But it's also possible that the mutation might do nothing, and G viruses have become more common because of dumb luck. Back when Ed Yong wrote this article in May, the evidence couldn't distinguish between two equally plausible explanations that the G viruses were more transmissible, or that the G viruses were just lucky. But in the two months since, more research has emerged. In June, this study by the Scripps Research Institute in the US found that lab experiments showed the Italian, or G strain, to be much more infectious. The mutation had the effect of markedly increasing the number of functional spikes on the viral surface, Cho adds. Those spikes are what allow the virus to bind to and infect cells. 
the number or density of functional spikes in the virus is four or five times greater due to this mutation, Cho says. Some media sources are quoting Cho as saying this leads to 10 times the infectivity. But it's unclear where that number comes from, as the source just states Cho is claiming it's much more infectious. Going back to the issues raised in the Atlantic article, how does this data address the question over whether the G-viruses were just lucky? Well, Cho and Farzan believe their biochemical experiments settle it. There have been at least a dozen scientific papers talking about the predominance of this mutation, Farzan says. Are we just seeing a founder effect? Our data nails it. It is not the founder effect. And in July, the authors of the original Los Alamos study published in the peer-reviewed journal Cell. A SARS-CoV-2 variant carrying the spike protein amino acid change D614G has become the most prevalent form in the global pandemic. It's the G on the end we're looking at here, that's what indicates it's the Italian strain. The consistency of its pattern was highly statistically significant, suggesting that the G614 variant may have a fitness advantage. I.e. the G variant is functionally different. This is the pickup truck we were worried about. In infected individuals, G614 is associated with lower RT-PCR cycle thresholds, suggestive of higher upper respiratory tract viral loads, although not with increased disease severity. So whilst we don't have evidence yet that the G variant is any more serious for the individual, it does appear to be manifesting differently in the body. And certainly a higher viral load in the upper respiratory tract would certainly lead to a greater probability of transmission. What does this mean? Well, firstly, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. I agree with Ed Yong when he says, individual pieces of research are extremely unlikely to single-handedly upend what we know about COVID-19. Lab tests haven't necessarily been replicated in the real world with previous diseases, and the cell study from July is implying a degree of causality that isn't backed up entirely by the data. But in any case, what we're seeing here is just the natural evolution of the virus. The more transmissible form will over time replace the original. And generally speaking, as time goes on, it's in the interests of the virus propagation for the virus to mutate into a less severe form rather than more so. It's much harder for severely ill people to be super spreaders than mildly ill people. This is one of the reasons why the authorities managed to keep the lid on the original SARS outbreak back in 2002. The illness struck people pretty hard and you didn't have the mildly ill or asymptomatic people wandering around spreading the virus that was seen with SARS-CoV-2. And what does this mean for a vaccine? Well, historically vaccines have usually been developed against early strains of a disease. And the virus is still so similar now to the initial sequence that there really isn't much reason to think the differences will matter, says Dr. Benjamin Newman from Texas University. The H1N1 annual vaccine is still using a strain from 2009. It's the ancestor of the various forms that have come after. And while there are differences now, a response against the ancestor seems to give good results against all the descendants. And like the flu, I think we can expect any immunity from a COVID vaccine to only last a limited amount of time. So expect to see fresh COVID vaccines every year, booster shots, and so on. And like the flu, expect perhaps only partial cover. Dr. Mark Schleiss though falls rather more on the optimistic side of that spectrum. When we finally have a COVID-19 vaccine, it will most likely protect people against the vast majority of circulating COVID-19 strains for the foreseeable mutations. So, some good news there, assuming we can actually get a vaccine in the first place, of course. So, are those different symptoms people are seeing a result of different strains of the virus? Most probably not. In all likelihood, they're due to the virus's uncanny ability to travel where it wants in the body through the vascular system, uh, its ability to attack the hypothalamus, and also the huge range of immune responses we're seeing between people, uh, including the cytokine storms, which can create a plethora of symptoms by themselves. I'd like to be able to write my own spectacular concluding statement on the subject, but I can't actually do any better than Ed Yong in The Atlantic. So, take it away, Ed. Between our insatiable need for information to assuage our anxiety and uncertainty, the media's tendency to report uncritically on incremental studies, and social channels that amplify extreme voices over careful ones, it's no wonder that confusion reigns. The misconceptions about dangerous strains are also seductive in their own right. If we believe that the virus has changed into some especially challenging form, we can more easily explain why certain people and places have been hit worse than others. A mystery whose answer, more likely, 
but less satisfyingly lies in political inaction, existing inequalities and chance. Powerful antagonists make for easy narratives. Ineptitude, bias and randomness make for difficult ones. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Thank you.